it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Joseph Barker with RapidDentures.com. He graduated from Arkansas State University in 1992 with a Bachelor of Science degree. He then graduated from Louisiana State University in 96 with his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree. He received the Operative Dentistry Award, an Outstanding Senior Dentist Award in 1996, as well as the New Dentist of the Year for Arkansas in 2006. After graduation, he moved back to his hometown of Newport, Arkansas. There he worked with Dr. Mike Brown as an associate dentist for eight years. He then purchased an office in Brinkley, Arkansas, where he worked for 11 years before selling his practice. In 2016, he opened his current practice in Searcy, Arkansas. Dr. Barker lives in Newport with his wife, Lori, and their son, Tyler. He is a member of the First Baptist Church, where he teaches Sunday school class. He enjoys mission work and helping those in need. In his time off, he also enjoys spending time with his family and their Labrador Retrievers. The entire family enjoys spending time outdoors. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, the reason I want you to come on the show so bad is um, I really believe that unless you do something once a week, you never really get good at it. You never get fast at it. You never get profit on it. You know, if you're going to – I look at the people who go to learn to place implants, and they'll go buy a $100,000 CVCT. They'll fly – to Dominican Republic with Arun Garg. That's another guy we got to get on the show. He's we've been talking to him a long time. Let's email him today, Arun Garg, and um, they'll go buy an implant deal. And then you come back and they're doing like one implant every two or three months. And then when that implant patient comes, um, you know that whole day they're trying to remember how to set up and do it all, and they never really reach critical mass. And you know if you're going to get into sleep apnea, you got to do it once a week, or you're not going to get profitable at it implants, Invisalign, if you're not doing it once a week, stop doing it. Either get to critical mass or stop doing it. But you, and then, and then when I talk to anybody about their, like their filling uh, technique, yeah, they'll change their composite and bonding agent and their technique maybe every five years or whole career. But then when you switch to dentures, oh my God, they haven't changed their denture protocol since dental school. They only do one every year. They hate doing them, and the reason they hate doing them is because they only do one a year. And here you love dentures. You're you're the weirdest unicorn in dentistry to sit there and love dentures. How the hell could you love dentures? What percent of dentists do you think hate dentures? Over fifty percent. Yeah, easily, <laughs> easily over fifty. And, so and then, did, so how did you learn to love dentures? Well, it was kind of a situation where all of my patients, I. When I practiced in Brinkley, it's really, really rural. So all of my patients would go to Little Rock and Memphis, and they would go to these denture clinics. Then they'd come back and want me to fix it. And, you know, sometimes you can't fix that. So I said, well, I'm going to come up with a way to, to maximize this, and I'm going to learn how to do it efficiently. And I'm going to do it. I'm putting it in my own lab. So I have my own denture lab. And I learned how to do it so I could – give them like something, a product, a, a service that I knew was going to last them and, and they'd stay with me. So that's what I did. And, you know, we went from doing like one or two dentures a month when I put the lab in to where for about the last seven years, we average about 30 units a month. For the last seven years, 30 units a month. Yes, sir. Now, now when now I sold my office, there was a lag for about a year and a half because I, did, I was just getting this one up and going. But we're, we've crept back up into that 25 to 30 range in the last six months. Now, who is a denture patient? Is it still grandma and grandpa, or have the demographics changed? Pretty much grandma and grandpa. Your younger ones, um, you know, are, are I don't see as many of the younger ones as I used to. Um, crystal meth does have an effect on them. And so when we see meth patients, they may be, 20, 25 years old, you're going to be pulling those teeth and making them dentures as well. But for the most part, it's a 40-year-old plus. Yeah, I remember when meth just started happening. And it's clusters. I mean, certain cities are killed by it and other cities are not affected. It's very weird. Like, like, um, like um, what's it called in California? That uh, Bakersfield just completely overran by it. You know, far higher levels than any cities nearby. And in Phoenix, for some reason, it's out in Apache Junction. And I, that was my first full mouth rehab that I lost completely in a year and a half because I was too dumb to realize that this 30-year-old kid, that the problem was meth. You know, I 
basically root canal and crown every tooth in his mouth. And mom and daddy paid? And mom and daddy paid. And it was a 30-year-old kid, and we basically rehabbed his entire mouth. I mean, it wasn't even 18 months, and it was mush. I'm like, what the hell? I mean, I, I was completely confused. Well, it turns out he doesn't have any saliva. He's tw- he was a tweaker. Right. And uh, so what percent of tweakers end in edentialism? Well, usually when I see them, it's on the tail end. Yeah. You know, I, I can't give you an honest percentage. How but- long do you think they were on it when they're at the tail end losing all their teeth? Probably years, I would say, you know, because what this is my understanding that they'll first of all, they they make they start out a little bit and then they gradually increase their usage to where then all of a sudden they go on these binges where they don't eat or drink. And then when they're coming down, they crave sugars. And that's part of the problem. The other problem is once they start making it, you know, that stuff has what muriatic acid and other chemicals in there. They'll put it on their gums when it's still wet. And the, the muriatic acid literally eats the enamel off. Yeah, and you know who busts all the, the meth labs in Arizona? It's never the police station. You know, you know who it is? The people down the street smell it? It's the fire department. When they blow up? Every time a trailer park busts out on fire, they're in there cooking meth. And, and in Phoenix, I'm serious, the, my police officer patients tell me that the fire department finds more meth labs than the police do. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. You know, where I live is pretty rural, so it's not uncommon for us to see... Like, um, if you're driving down a back country road, you might see an ice chest or something over in the hedgerow. You don't go over there. I can tell you that. You leave it alone. Why, why is that? Because it's probably a, a meth lab cooking in that ice chest. Huh. Amazing. They have, these, they have them now. I, I, I used to have a lot of police friends in, in other cities. So, But they tell me they can make it in a Coke bottle now. Like... Mix all the greens, shake it up, and set the Coke bottle somewhere in an ice chest and let the chemical reactions occur, and then they get their meth out of there somehow. Huh. So if my homies went to rapiddentures.com, you have a complete system, DVD. Um, t- talk about your system. You know, lo- lots of people listening to you right now are saying, man, I haven't changed my denture technique since dental school. What, what are you really going to um, teach them on your DVD series? How much is it? How many hours is it? It's uh, it's uh, about two and a half hours long. It's two DVDs. I'll show it to you here. Can you see that? Yep. Rapid dentures. Open your doors to predictable, efficient, and profitable dentures. Training volumes one and two. Hold it up a little higher. One and two. Techniques that save you time and money. And you got one of my idols um, endorsing you, Dr. Chris Griffin. Yes, sir. Uh, where's he from? South uh, Tennessee? Rip- Ripley, uh, Mississippi, which is just below the Tennessee line, just a few miles. Ripley, Mississippi. Yes, sir. And so w- with our system, though, you, you, when you say no one has changed their denture system, you're right. The vast majority of people who still make dentures, we still do it the way that they taught us in dental school. You know, preliminary impressions. And then the patient goes home and we make... Uh, a custom tray and then the patient goes home again after we take a final impression and we have five appointments six appointments in a denture case and we wonder why it's not profitable and so I just set out on a journey to learn how to do it so I visited a lot of people and uh, came up with this system and here's how it works we teach you how to take your primary impression and I use a system by Ivaclar it used to be system one and system two They've changed it now to, to a new system. Um, we just got in the stuff. But but what it is, is you're doing, it's, it's an alginate system. And so you take a preliminary impression with that. We send a patient home. But on, on that preliminary impression, I'm going to go ahead and get all my, where my lip line is, through through something called a verticorder. And I'll, I'll show you that. I'll have them bring it in here in a minute. A verticorder, I have them. We take the vertical dimension with a, a um, with this verticorder, and so it sets their their video on the first appointment. I also take their lip line on on the um, papillometer. I said that wrong while ago. I take their lip line with a papillometer, and in doing that, I've got all that information. And then the cool thing is, I take a bite with a blue moose. I use actually blue bite by Shine because it's cheaper. 
And so I've got their upper and lower impressions, their lip line, their video, everything set in a blue bite. And so when it goes to the lab, that's the first appointment. Second appointment, I'm trying in teeth. And then I take a wash impression inside of that wax try-in. And some some people say, well, I, I, I don't have good luck with the wax. I just have them make an acrylic base and set the teeth on that. It doesn't matter. So the third appointment, my patients are getting their dentures. And I have better success with that than I ever did the other way. Man, that's a lot of knowledge you'd have to know. Um, what percent of your secret sauce is having a lab tech in your office? I would say l less than 30, 40 percent. Because most labs, here's the thing about labs, and I know this for a fact, because I've had other people come work for me out of other labs. You, you know, we spend, I don't know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks per final impression tray that the lab's going to pour up and throw away. Then we spend about 30 something dollars per wax rim. So for a, a case of upper and lower, you're, you're spending an extra hundred dollars, 120 bucks for wax rims and a final impression tray. Okay. So I've eliminated all that and that's a savings, but this is what a lot of labs don't tell you. You don't, unless you ask, you don't know what teeth they're using. And the reason I say that, most labs are willing to make you an economy denture or make you a middle-of-the-road denture or make you a premium denture. And yet as dentists, we don't do that. We just assume they all make the one kind, you know. And there's, as you well know, hundreds of people out there making teeth. I'm talking about lab manufacturers manufacturing the dental teeth themselves, the acrylic and the porcelain. I don't use porcelain, but the acrylic as well. And so what you have... it. These guys get for a lab bill of about 400 to 450 bucks per arch. And so, you know, if you're willing to negotiate and ask your lab some questions, you can negotiate that down to a couple hundred bucks. And so to answer your question about what percent does it help having my lab tech, I would say about 30 or 40 percent because anybody can set your teeth. You know, I mean, you can send it off and have the teeth set. The biggest thing is having a supply of teeth that saves me money and also the way I do it, I send it to any lab, I've done it, send it to other labs the way we do it and every one of them sends me back exactly the same thing. It's perfect. Do you advertise and market like a economy, middle of the road, high end? Yeah. I mean, how, how many price point dentures do you market and what are the fees for those? I, I market an economy, a deluxe and a premium. I used to just make an economy and a premium. And I had a friend come to my office one day and he said, well, what dentures do you make? And I showed him and we had premium teeth. You know, we were using some by Horaeus Colzer called uh, Mondial at the time for our premium. And then we were using a, a, a tooth, um, probably cost me about six bucks an arch for the economy. I don't, I don't use that particular tooth anymore. It's an Arctic tooth. But now, he goes, well, you need to offer a middle, middle of the road. I said, why? He said, they always pick the middle. I said, okay. So at that time, we were about 75% economy, 25% premium. The moment I added the deluxe, the middle of the road, it immediately went to 60% deluxe, 25% premium. That stayed the same, and then the rest were economy. And the only difference in our so deluxe was economy. Uh, eight, 15? No, the economy was 489 per arc. No, no, no. You said you said that when you offered the deluxe, the premium stayed the same at 25%. The deluxe yeah, yeah. went to 60%. So the economy went down to 15%? About 15%. So it went from 75% to 15% by offering in the middle of the road. Right. And that's what every PhD economist will tell you the research says. That you don't yeah. do high and low, you do high, middle, low. Oh, I didn't. He, he told me that I did it. Just stepped out in faith, and immediately profitability shot up. So, what are you charging for economy, deluxe, and premium? I charge four eighty nine per arch for economy. I charge seven eighty nine per arch for deluxe, and I charge twelve sixty nine, I believe it is, for premium per arch. And the only really difference between all three of those is the teeth you're using. The difference between economy, the economy and, and the deluxe is the teeth. That's it. 
and it's a two hundred, it's a three hundred dollar swing. So for a set of dentures, my cost went up ten bucks per arch, but my profitability went up three hundred bucks. So what teeth are used in an economy versus deluxe versus premium today? I use um, Z Dent. It's a there's a it's a company by Shine. It's Shine's tooth. And if you buy them in bulk, sometimes I get them for a dollar to a dollar fifty a card, and you have two cards per arch. And they're called Zedita. Z Dent. Z slash Dent. Okay, Z Dent for the economy, and then for the deluxe. It's called um, Elident. Elident. Yes, sir. And who makes that? Is it Elident? Uh, my lab guy orders those for me. I'm just. And, the, uh, and then for the premium, what do you use? Well, we usually use Mondial, which is uh, from uh, Horaeus Culzer. And sometimes we'll use the uh, porcelain, IP, or not porcelain, but the IPNT, True Bite. IPN from True Bite? Yes, sir. And are all these acrylics, or do you use acrylics or porcelains? I use all acrylic. So, I, don't, I don't like porcelain. Okay, talk about that. Why, why do you like acrylics, and why do you not like porcelain? One, the acrylics now look really good. The older acrylics, you know, as you know, from long ago, the acrylics didn't look as natural and lifelike as the porcelain. But now they've got those acrylics where they look really, really nice. But the other thing is it bonds to the acrylic. And so you have less, I find, less trouble with them popping out. You know, patient ch coming in, because porcelain tooth is only held by mechanical retention, period. Whereas acrylic is held by, by uh, we do mechanical and the, the, you know, chemical bond. So it makes a big difference. And the porcelain, you don't hear them clacking with acrylic teeth like you do with porcelain. You know, when those patients come in and it sounds like they got a marble in their mouth. So that's why I, I like the, uh, the acrylic. Plus, plus, I have a wider range of choices. And that really makes a big deal. Man, that, that is amazing. So um, everybody is afraid of doing a denture because they're always afraid they're going to get that patient who comes in every week for the rest of their life with an ill-fitting denture. What percent of your cases turn out to be that nightmare? Less than 10, for sure. Less than 10%? Oh, yeah. Yeah, most of the time, you know, but it's all, we, we all, well, I shouldn't say we, but I, most of my buddies and I, we all want to help people, but we don't want to tell them the truth. We don't want to tell them, you don't have any gums. Your bones, lost, you know, and I've just found it's better to be gut honest and say, Wow, you don't have any bone left. You don't, you know, you've got a knife edge ridge on the lower. And I just tell them everything on the front end and and I'm very gut honest about it. And then I say, I may can help you, but I want you to understand you you're gonna have limitations and you may have to wear adhesive. And so if you set that up versus, man, you're gonna be eating corn on the cob and biting apples off the core, that's two different conversations. And so I think it's all about getting realistic patient expectations on the front end and then following through with that. Yeah, satisfaction equals perception of what's happening minus what I expected. And what everyone should be doing is always lowering patients' expectations. But dentists are always raising it. They'll say to the dentist, well, after that root canal, why have any pain? No, you'll be fine. Maybe a little aspirin or Tylenol. Why the hell would you say that? Yeah. You know, I, I tell them, my God, when this anesthetic wears off, I hope you have a pistol in your house because you're going to want to blow your head off. And, uh, you know, you just prepare them for death. And then if yeah. they just survive, they think you're a saint. That's and, right. uh, you know, they'll do it with women uh, on cosmetic cases. They'll say, oh, when I'm done, you won't even be able to tell that it's an implant and a crown on your front tooth. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, um, crazy. Um, I, I tell people on a denture, it's like having a wooden leg. You know, you can walk from point A to B, but you're not going to run, skip, and hop. I mean, yeah. it's a wooden leg. So when, so what percent of your dentures do you think end up um, using adhesives? About 50% or more. And what but adhesive I, do you like? Well, I have, I used to just be a fix-a-dent guy, you know, just fix-a-dent, it's fine, whatever you can get at Walmart. And then I had a patient about two years ago come in my office, and she told me about something she had ordered offline from uh, Europe. It's called Secure. 
I'll have them bring some in here in a minute. But this Secure, it's the, it's the best I've seen. I'm not telling you it's the greatest thing ever, but it's the best adhesive I've seen. And so I became a dealer just so I can get it for my patients. And if you go online now, you can find it at Walmart and Walgreens. They've now started carrying it. But it really does work. Walmart and, and uh, Walgreens oh, carry yes, it in the store or online? Um, some stores, but for sure online. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send Dana a message and have her bring us some secure. I recently became a dealer, too, but my attorney says I can't talk about it <laughs> on my podcast. Well, I, I'm in Arkansas. That's how we make our cash money. <laughs> so, yeah, I see a secure denture cream. Right. Um, and they also have a zinc-free. Do you, do you think right. they, does the zinc concern you? Are you a zinc-free, or do you like I the don't... cushion strips? or? Well... There, there's uses for all of them. Hang on one second, uh, and I'll tell you. I got patients that use it all. I've got if if you have an elderly patient and they don't want, you know, they've had this denture for 20 years longer than they've had their own pair of shoes. They are going to benefit from secure or from from like a, a the cushions. You know what I'm talking about? The C bonds and those type things because it's going to fill in a void and it's kind of like a makeshift reline. But if your denture fits well and fits their tissue what they have well, then then they don't need to be using C-Bond. What they need to be using is something along the lines of a powder or a cream. And that's where you get into the fix a dents Here's that Secure right here. Secure, the waterproof denture adhesive, 12-hour holding powder, good value, one time per day. It says holding powder. Is it a powder or is it a cream like a toothpaste? It, it's 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 a cream. It's a power. That's not that says power. Holding oh, power. power. Twelve hour holding power. Yes, sir. Okay. But so so if your denture fits well, then then a C bond is not gonna help you. You're gonna have to have something like a cream or a powder. And I would say about twenty five percent of my patients like the powder and the rest of them use creams. You know, in a very few, if they if I make them a denture, C bond's not gonna work. Uh, I just had a case probably about a month ago, maybe two months at the longest. I made an elderly gentleman. He's partially blind. Elderly gentleman, I made him a denture. Well, he's used to putting in C-Bond and going for a week without changing it out because he can't see. Well, I made his denture fit too good, and he couldn't use C-Bond. So he had to start using cream. And he's, he's adapted, but I told him, I said, you, you're not going to be able to do this. Once, if, if I make you a new one. So, anyway, he's he's adapted. Do you place implants? Yes, sir. Yeah, so what what percent of, um, when, when, you, when you market for um, economy, deluxe, premium, uh, uh, denture, and people are coming in, what percent do you upgrade to uh, um, denture over uh, two implants uh, snap-on or, or, or four implants and a hater bar or... or, or what percent do you upgrade to an implant? 10, 10 to 15 percent, depending on the month. And right now, I average placing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 to 20 implants a month. Oh, my gosh. You are crushing it. 10 to 20 implants a month. And and what is the standard? I mean, on the implant upgrade, is it, do you have an economy deluxe premium? I mean, is it mostly um, well, if they, on two? This is what I've learned. This is what I've learned. And I just learned this probably in about the last six months since the last time we talked. I was letting them pick. I don't care which denture you get. I don't care if you get the economy, deluxe, or premium. And we'll put two implants in. Four is better. You know, and on the top, I tell them they need at least four. Six is better. I don't care what they get. I mean, I just want, it's my job to tell them what they need, what's going to work, and then they can pick. I don't care. But what I've learned is, is that my economy and my deluxe is a poor technique acrylic. OK, and the teeth are a little bit weaker. And I find that they wear the teeth a lot faster with with the implants in place. And so I tell them all, if you're considering implants, you really need to get the premium denture because the teeth are going to hold up. And, I, and on my premium, you ask, I, won't, I hate to regress, but a while ago you asked me about the difference in my dentures. My economy and my deluxe are the same except for teeth. However, my deluxe and my premium, the difference is I use a heat injected acrylic on the premium. And then I also use a real high grade tooth, whether it be a, a 
IPN or whatever, Mondial, just, you know, a high grade tooth. So, so when I tell them, if you're getting implants or considering it, you really need to consider the premium because it's going to hold up. And I tell them what we're finding is, is that we used to allow our patients to get deluxe and economy, but now we're seeing that, that it's not holding up. And so I don't want you to be coming in because your denture is going to fit different. You're going to increase your chewing power of the implant. And when you increase this chewing power, sometimes the teeth don't hold up. Absolutely. And I, just tell them, I let them pick, you know. It's like everybody loves their upper denture, but they have all their problems with their lower denture. And then you make it at the lower denture implant retained, snapping onto just two or four. And now their upper denture they, they, is the problem. Right. Uh, because the upper denture used to be really good because the lower one was so horrible. But now the lower one's better than the upper. It's so secure. It's knocking the upper one all around. Um, right. So when you do a 10 to 15% upgrade to implants, uh, what what kind of implants? Are you talking about mini implants, full implants? I do both. Whatever the bone will allow. I want the biggest one I can get in there. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's Arkansas terminology, but, you know, they've, they've proven out surface area is what holds the implant in. And so I want, you know, the biggest one within reason, but I, I prefer to go like a 3.25 up to a 4.25 three or five i use osteo ready and i use oco biomedical implants. okay oco biomedical that's out of uh, um albuquerque, albuquerque new mexico right what was the other one you said osteo ready they used to be it was brady frank are you familiar with brady frank sure in seattle yes right it was his implant company and i don't know if he sold it or done something with it but now it's on the east coast the implants stayed the same so i, I kept using them but it's now, is Brady Frank involved with it anymore? I don't think so. So he sold it to someone on the East Coast? Well, I I don't know. I I don't know who he sold it to. Where, where is it on the East Coast? I have no idea. I just called the 1-800 number. Huh. See, I'm always calling 1-900 numbers, but that, that's a whole different. It's <laughs> a whole different. Uh, uh, 800. 1-800. That's a whole different implant. Um, yeah. So, um. <laughs> So that that is very, so. What percent would you say are so? Who do you use for a mini? Um, if it's if it's on the upper, I will use OCO. OCO is uh, biomedical. Right. And Albuquerque has a mini implant. Right. Okay. And I like OCO because they've got implants from I think two point four millimeters all the way up to six or seven millimeters in diameter. So so. Basically, a mini implant, by definition, is just anything under 3.0. That's exactly is, right. Is a 3.0 considered an implant, or is that a mini? Is it 2.999 and less is a mini, or is it 3.0? Is 3.0 a mini, or is that a roof form? That, all I know is they just keep, they, they hammer one way or the other, depending on who you're talking to and what, what you're reading. 3.0 yeah. is, is the cutoff for both. 3.0 and greater, they say, is a standard conventional implant and then anything 3.0 or less is a mini so a 3.0 i'm not sure what he is and you know 3m one of the greatest dental companies in the world they had a mini implant and they quit selling it what was the name of their mini implant uh what did imitate imtech and i can't find anybody who will tell me why they stopped imtech do you have any I idea no sir i know who makes one similar to it though is glidewell labs out of california they make one that's similar. But to answer your question, if it's on the lower, I like those Lodi's. Are you familiar with those? No. L-O-D-I. L-O-L-O-D-I. And it's a locator overdenture implant, and it's from Zest. Oh, Zest, yeah. That's been their core competency for a long time. They've got a new locator out now, but I like the other one so well, I hate to change. Yeah. But the Lodi comes either 2.4 or 2.9 and it really works well on, on on mandibular hard bone but when you get into maxilla i finally had a guy tell me what it was the thread pattern is wrong for maxillary cancellous bone you need hard bone well the um who just made a change in the uh the the um female part of the uh ball and socket where you know you, you're always having to change out the o-rings Right. And uh, so someone came out with a different O-ring that pretty much doesn't, almost never has to be changed out. Have you heard of that? No, sir. 
Was that the Zest one? Well, Zest, you know, Locator is is a has a housing, and it's got a, a nylon insert inside that housing that snaps onto the implant. Yeah, I think it's that nylon that has to be is, is the key there because um, it's uh, you know the other ones are more of a rubber material that went south on you pretty quick, and this nylon one um, is is going to last so much longer. Right, I I have to change those out, and changing them out is really really fast. But I can change out a, a nylon, two two implants, less than five minutes. I can have them back gone. Nice. So so what percent? So on these upgrades to implants, you say ten to fifteen percent upgrade. What percent are doing like a two or four? Or six? What what? How do you break that out? I mean, the well, least amount. I, I here's what I tell them. I don't like two. You know, and I know like in Australia, they're doing that now. I think it is where they just put one implant. Yeah. But I tell them, I'm, I'm like, I don't like two because if one fails, there's always a three to five percent chance your body's going to reject this. I never say the implant's going to fail because the implant doesn't fail. The body rejects it. You know, titanium doesn't change. So I tell them. That's so, crucial wording. I like that. You know, the titanium's still fine. Yeah. But your body didn't accept it. Right. And that's what I tell them. And what percent of them are smokers, drinkers, diabetes, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's not like you're doing these denture, overdentures on a yoga instructor. No, they're not. They're not eating apples and organic all day long, I can promise you, and living on grilled chicken and asparagus and broccoli. And they're, and they're older. Right. So here's what I tell them. So I don't like two, but I prefer three or four. And mo most of them get three, and I don't know the exact percentages. Some get four, and then occasionally, you know, very few, I, very few times do I do two. So always, do you know? Do you know the the Australian doing one? No, sir. I yeah. just know they're doing it. But you know, but that that was his point with the fact that you know when you have two and one fails, now you got this cockeyed uh, deal, and uh, he he thinks the whole forces of just the whole thing just works better just pivoting off one right up the middle and uh he swears by it what i do is i'll put two about the canine position and then i'll put one dead center yeah and i tell them look if, if you know if one of these fails we still got two and what we'll do is clean out this other one and then we'll put you another one in yeah and, and i and i don't I don't get too caught up about the cost, meaning if I have to pay to put another implant in, I don't care. Well, what do you I, what are you charging to place an implant? So, so you, you're you're saying you got to use the premium. So that's right. the uh, that's the um, the twelve sixty twelve sixty nine. Right. That's twelve sixty nine. Then how much for uh, adding additional implants underneath it? I charge thirteen eighty nine per implant, and I charge I think. Almost five, like four eighty nine or something like that, for the abutment. The abutment? You mean the the casing in the uh, denture? No, sir. Just the, the you know the locator. If I attach that. Or oh, okay. So so I, so are you doing it two surgery? So you'll place the implant and let it completely heal up, then go back on a second surgery and place the uh, the uh, attachment. Very rarely. Most of the time, I place the attachment same day. I'll so, punch, I'll so punch 1389 the, for the implant and 489 for what are you calling it? The abutment. The abutment. Right. And then any cost for the the locator in the in the denture? No, it's all included. Uh, uh, Charles Blair, I I was wanting to add a fee for that because I still know I'm cheaper than most people on implants. But Charles Blair in his book on insurance coding said that you can't do that. That's part that the housing inside the Denture is part of the abutment fee. Did you watch this podcast I did with Charles Blair? No, sir. Oh, man, you got to go back and watch that. That that was an amazing, an amazing podcast on um, pe people just don't maximize their insurance billing. Thing. So you're basically getting $1,878 per implant then. Right. So that, that that's a nice fee. That's a nice fee. I mean, you're getting 789 for the denture and then another uh, 1878 Yeah. Yeah. Um, the podcast, no, it was number 780 for Charles Blair. is a podcast 780, online dental coding uh, with Dr. Charles Blair. 
I will watch it because I like him. I like his books. Oh, yeah. Gosh, my gosh. So all you cover all this in your DVD series? I don't cover the implants. Are, but I was going to... Sh- go are, ahead. Are you, are you going to add another DVD someday? I want to do... I've had a lot of people ask me to do a DVD on partials, removable partial dentures. And then some have asked about the implants, but, you know, a lot of guys just won't do implants. I just say, you got to do them. You know, I mean, you got to offer your patients something and they don't want to go anywhere else, especially if you're very rural. They don't want to go, they don't want to drive to Little Rock. They don't want to go to Jonesboro and those kind of places that are an hour, hour and a half away. They want to get it done right here. They trust you. So, you know, you did something that um, hardly anyone does. You had a practice for 11 years in Brinkley, Arkansas, and you sold it and packed up. And then in 2016, um, you, you went and to Cersei. I mean, you, so you already had this well-established practice in Brinkley for a, over a decade. What made you pack up and leave Brinkley and go to Cersei? A 10-year-old boy. He's 10-year-old now. My wife and I adopted our son six years ago. And Brinkley was an hour away from my house. I was driving about an hour to hour and 10 minutes a day one way. To where? So, from my, from my house is in Newport, Arkansas, and my office, the old office, was about an hour and 10 minutes away from my house. In Brinkley. In Brinkley. So I was driving there every day, and I was on the road, so I, was, I would leave about the time he got up, and I would be getting home about the time he went to bed. And so I was a part-time dad, at best. And uh, I just, my wife and I talked about it and said, hey... You know, he's only going to be young once. I need to be a dad, and he needs a dad a whole lot more, and I need to be working and being gone. So we just kept praying about it, and th- this opportunity came open. I sold it, and uh, we came here. Last year was a little bit of a struggle, but this year's, you know, we just been blessed. Wow. Why did you adopt a boy? I would have given you all four of mine. <laughs> I would, well, I would have hired you haul and sent them all your way. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ryan. He has, to, he has to sit here next to me and hear this shit all day long. One, <laughs> one, one day in the middle of the podcast, I'm, he's probably just going to hit me over the head with a frying pan. But yeah, you know, what is it? Work, um, family, friends, health. I mean, it's like, you know, your whole life you juggle these four balls of work, family, health, friends. And work is the only ball that's a rubber ball. You drop work, it'll bounce right back up. But the family, the friends, the health, those are porcelain balls, glass balls. You drop one of them, and they shatter. That's right. And you'll, you'll always have plenty of work. You can be a workaholic all you want. But, man, you blow a relationship with uh, one of your four sons or your best friend or your health. I mean, how many rich people uh, got there, and they skipped the gym, and they had a Starbucks in the morning, they had McDonald's at lunch, and then they're, uh, you know, 50 something 60 and they dropped out of a heart attack and it's like uh you know you can uh you know work is a rubber ball family friends and health that's a glass ball so if you're going to drop one drop the work so that was that that was cool well let let me show you some stuff but my ex told me i should work more hours when my kids were young so that i wouldn't mess them up they said you're (laughs) really a bad influence so we really need you to work 12 hours a day seven days a week and please don't ruin your children yeah but it's so, too late. They're all rude. Yeah, send pictures <laughs> to your kids. Hey, this is what I do. So, so because I don't want, I want to make sure you don't. I got the DVD, and then I have the. This is a transcript of the whole thing. So, so if a doctor buys this, he can follow along. Well, you know, it's tough because to help you market this, I wanted to do a podcast. Um, you ought to um, write an article in Dental Town Magazine about your system. Well, I, I can. Uh, and I also or over that or over that or would you be afraid you'd explain it too much that they wouldn't need your system? No, I can. I mean, it, it it would be hard to write just one article and explain it all. You know, yeah. I, I do have this though. It's what I was going to show you. I came, Doctor Griffin, Chris Griffin. He does a logarithm kind of thing for every one of his systems. Right. And so I put this together. I don't. It's it's pretty fine print, but for every system. I have that, so it's just a flow chart of how you can follow along. And so what I decided to do is that everybody who buys this system, I'll just throw these flow charts in. Like this one is 
a new patient that's totally edentulous. The next one here is a new patient that has teeth and they want to get their teeth extracted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That route. And so there's a whole flow chart that says, hey, this is how you do it one way or the other. Then I have this one. It's on, this is my this is my dentures here. It says what they cost, and it's an economy, a deluxe or a premium on the partial. And so I just I don't mind including that for people to see what we do. And then the last thing that I have here, and this right here is my checkoff list that my patients have to sign. This is probably worth more than anything. Yeah. This is where I have them initial that they like the color, the size, the shape, the length, the width, and the bite before I ever process it. And then I have down here there will be a fee. If you change your mind after it's processed, I've never charged the fee, but it cuts all that stuff out. All the wishy washes and I have them sign it and I have a witness and then I sign it. <laughs> yeah. But this, yeah. But that's uh that's true though. Isn't it? Uh, um, yeah. Well, you know what? I, uh, I, I wish I, I'm emailing you right now. Uh, with Tom Jacoby is the, uh, the, uh, editor. And uh, I wish uh, I wish you and, and I also love that, Chris, because, you know, the bottom line, you know, there's there's something different about the South. I mean, you're in Arkansas and the, one of the greatest companies in the world, Walmart, was uh, born in uh, Rogers, Arkansas in 1962, the year I was born. Then they their headquarters in Bentonville. And, you know, and Chris Griffin, he's over from Mississippi. And, you know, the, the boys in the South have one eye on their customer and one eye on cost. And they always figure out, and another one is, uh, who's that guy, um, Corey Glenn. I mean, Corey Glenn, I mean, if you gave that guy a quarter, he'd squeeze 30 cents out of it. I mean, <laughs> they just, you guys just, and it, I think it's because your customer base has less money. There's more poor people in, uh, in, in uh, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky, and there's a lot of, throwaway money in California and Connecticut and Manhattan. I mean, when people are coming in for a veneer in Manhattan, it's not a price of sale. And you boys just always find that entrepreneurialism, one eye on the customer, one eye on cost. You always figure out how to do something faster, easier, higher in quality, lower in cost. And uh, I, I, I love you guys from that because, you know, I was from Kansas. I remember the first, the first, uh, um, curriculum I ever went on, it was to the Panky Institute in Key Biscayne, Florida. The guy's opening lecture, I'll never forget it. Here I am from Kansas, parents from Parsons, Kansas, you know, completely born on the wrong side of the tracks. We're all born in a barn. Uh, that's why we all leave the door open. And they're talking about the A patient, the B patient, the C patient, the D and the F. My entire pedigree was the D and F patient that you're not supposed to treat. And I was just morally outraged, like, dude, I'd rather own McDonald's than Ruth Chris. And there's a hell of a lot more money. You know, you go, how many lectures you go to and they talk about Nordstrom's, Nordstrom's, Nordstrom's. Well, would you rather own Walmart or Nordstrom's? Walmart all day long. Oh, my God. And Sam Walton, do you know till the day he died, his desk was a door on two, uh, the, what, do, what do you call those, uh, saw horses? Oh, yeah. It was a door on two. And when he died... He actually was trans uh, flying back and forth to a Houston interferon clinic, and when he died, they found him on the floor behind his desk. I mean, he worked till he died, and 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 his top managers, a couple of really big boys back in the day, got fired because, and when you worked for Walmart, when you guys traveled, you stayed at the Motel Six, two to a room, and some of these guys, their Walmart stock was worth you know hundreds of millions of dollars. They're like, well, I'm going to go stay at a five star resort, and he says. That ain't the culture of Walmart. And, you know, I don't want all your boys staying at the Motel 6 and you up there at the Marriott. And, and they got fired for it. I mean, he did not like, just because you were rich, you know. But anyway, I, I just love that whole story. There's a, there's a statue or a, 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 a monumental in Newport because the store that fired him, that inspired him to, to it was a Ben Franklin store was in Newport. He got fired. My hometown, he got fired there. And he told him, he said, when I, I'm going to come back, I'm going to put you out of business. And he, when he opened his store in Newport, Ben Franklin went out of business. And there's a monument at the old Ben Franklin store right now. And what was Ben Franklin doing wrong? Why did you want to put him out of business? Because they fired him because he wanted to bring it to the masses. 
He wanted to have a Walmart, the, what we know as a Walmart philosophy and mentality in business, and they didn't like that. And they fired him, and he said, when I come back, I will put you out of business, and he did it. He was friends with my grandpa. He was, Sam Walton was? Yes, sir. Oh, my God. I, I, I still got a picture. I, uh, um, you know, I was in Wichita, so that was six hours. And my dad, let me tell you how weird my dad is. <laughs> he told me, he said, Howard, because all Muslims, they all try to make it back to Mecca once in their lifetime. He says, well, we're capitalists. We are capitalists. We're going to drive to Bentonville, Arkansas, or Rogers, Arkansas, and we're going to see the birthplace of capitalism in America. I'm like, okay, whatever. You're my dad. And we got this big old Lincoln Town car, and we drove six hours all the way to Rogers. My dad, he was telling me all these stories about Sam Walton and Ray Kroc, and he was telling me about how Sam Walton would fly around. He met the owners of uh, J.C. Penney and Gibsons and T.G. and Y., and he was a humble man, and and, and and he thought it was, uh, you know, he would go to all of his major competitors and ask the owners, well, you know, what do you think I'm doing right? And you know why they would tell him? You know why they would all give away their secret sauce? Because he was in Rogers and Bentonville and all those other stores were only in the big urban cities. And Sears said, well, the people of, of uh, Rogers and Bentonville, I mean, the only thing they're good for is to send them a catalog. I mean, you're not going to go out there and build a store. And, and Sam was like, well, that, that's half of America. Half of America lives in these little towns you never heard of, like Rogers, Bentonville, Searcy, um, you know, um, um, you know all, all these places, Brinkley, Arkansas. No one's heard of Brinkley, Arkansas. They only hear of Little Rock. And dentists are still making that mistake. You know, now, now Sam Walton and Ray Crocker are dead, and two-thirds of all the graduating class goes to the big cities like Little Rock and says, Brinkley, Searcy, Rogers, and who the hell's going to go there? They know nothing about demographic studies or nothing. They, they, before I built this office, I did traffic studies, demographic studies. I knew what the competitive ratio was before. I, people don't know that stuff. They just want to go because it looks good. Yeah. Hey, I yeah. got something to show you. I showed you this once before, but I just want to tell you, this is what inspired me. Ah, uh, you're too kind. Who is is that Brad Pitt on the cover? I believe it is. It's either him or that Brady guy from the Patriots. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> the business of dentistry, consumer and dentistry of the night. Ryan, we have to make that an audio book. So you do you remember what year you bought that? 1994 or five. Wow, I wasn't even alive back then, so it couldn't have been me. That was hey, too many years I ago. Put it in New Orleans, you spoke at the New Orleans. Uh, is, I don't remember if it was an ADA. It was, was an ADA meeting. Yeah, you spoke there in like 94, 95, something like that. Yeah, I spoke there at 94, 95, and then was banned from ever speaking for them again. <laughs> you would not believe the letters I got from the ADA on that. I mean, my God, you said fart 18 times. You said shit. You said damn. And it's like, dude, that's, that's PG-13. I mean, rated R, there's nudity, the F-bomb. I said, you know, I said, I, I'm the cleanest act you, you had. And they uh, they were just, it's so funny. You go talk to a thousand. I mean, that was a big audience. It was in New Orleans. I was so excited. I crushed it. I mean, when I left there, I was left there. I mean, I crushed it. But, you know, there's always that, you know, one, two, five percent, you know, and they're all okay. And, and, and they only listen to that. And I, I told you, I said, dude, I'm lecturing. I saw their faces. I saw people spit up coffee and Coke on the floor. You know, we're, you know, were you not in that room? And they're like, well, look what she said. It's like, I, I don't care what she said. If you're trying to please everyone, you need to die today. Hey, do you, I don't know if you remember saying this. You gave a lecture one time in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I had my brother there. And one of the funniest things I ever heard you say was when you were, I, I actually, when you say spit stuff on the floor, I did. I promise you. I had a mouthful of something. I don't remember what it was, but whoever they got a shower. You told the story about your <laughs> how how a vet and a dentist get it wrong. The vet calls all of the people who supply him and they pay for his sign. And a dentist calls and says, Hey, why don't you, you know, 3M, won't you sponsor my sign? And they say, No, I don't know part of that. But a vet, Purino sponsor it, you know, and all the heart guard and all that will sponsor their sign. And you said, So here's the difference in Americans. He said, my dog got sick. That's what you said. 
and you went to to, to the vet and your dad bent down and kissed that dog he said you're going to get to meet jesus you remember that? Uh, his name was Nippy, and he gained like, he like doubled his weight in three days. I think I was about ten years old, and Dad was off doing something, some Sonic, and my mom kept saying, "Well, when your father gets back, you know, you can talk to your brother." So my dad came back, and I'm like, "Dad, Nippy, he's really sick, and all that." So we drive down the vet. My dad's got this big old Lincoln Town car, and he's got all these Sonic drive-ins. He's got bank, and the vet looks at Nippy, and he comes back and he says, Nip, "Nippy's sick. He needs an operation." And it's going to be $1,000. My dad leaned over and he kissed Nippy. He said, Nippy, you're going to see Jesus. And I'm like, no, dad, no. Give him the $1,000. He's like, I can get you a damn dog for free. I ain't paying $1,000. He said, a fool and his money will always part. You don't invest $1,000 to a blankety blank damn dog. And uh, so I cried, cried, cried. So my dad negotiated. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. I'll take him to my buddy. He's got a farm. And we'll let him loose on that farm. And he'll run around, and I'm sure he'll be fine. And I bet when my dad took him to that farm, Nippy ran. But he probably only ran about 10 feet. <laughs> my dad <laughs> blasted him. <laughs> but he didn't even pay to put him down. He put him down himself. But, uh, yeah, that was a, that was tough. But, and, now you, and now I practice. Can't make this up. Cross the street from a veterinarian, 30 years. I've been on my side of 48th Street. He's been on his side. My office, 3,800. His, his office, 5500 He does a million dollars a year more than me. And I can't tell you in the last 30 years how many times I told people they needed to get this dentistry done. They go, I don't have the money. I just I just spent $3,000 on my cat. It's like, cat, a cat is dinner in many countries. You paid $3,000 for your dinner? How the yes. hell do you spend $3,000 on dinner? But so, yeah, so uh, I'm sure we just lost a lot of viewers. Huh? I'm sure, a lot of people will never listen to dentistry uncensored ever again. Hey, can Ryan <laughs> edit that part out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ryan says he won't. He wants his show to die more than anyone. <laughs> There's no one that wants his show to come to an end more than Ryan. But uh, he's still regretting taking his job. But uh, but yeah. Um, so let me so let me ask you this question. So God dang, I can't believe we already gone over an hour. But and I, I, got one thing to, I got one thing to say. You sent me an email one time asking me to do something for um, CE on Dental Town. Yeah. So I actually got it. I got the rough draft done. I've got the PowerPoint made. It's on um, troubleshooting dentures. And I was going to put that on your website on, on Dental Town if you wanted. You, you mean for the online CE? Yes, sir. I would absolutely love that. I mean that would be amazing. I've got um I've got I don't know it's probably an hour and a half two hours worth of stuff on you know why people hate why dentists hate dentures and why patients hate dentures and if you can troubleshoot both of them everybody's happy. Well, I will send you an email right now. So I'm Howard at Dental Town. The guy who does the online CE is Howard Goldstein. So since there was already a Howard, he's Hogo, H-O-G-O, for Howard Goldstein at Dentaltown.com. I will send you guys uh, an email right now. Well, I, I would love that course. So, so my, my final question is this. She's been listening to you for an hour. She's commuting to work. She graduated two months ago. She's working as an associate of some office. And she's listening. She's saying, Joe, I hate dentures. I just hate them. What would you say to her? I mean, do you think... She's a potential uh, customer to go to rapiddentures.com and learn this stuff, or if she hates it, she'll always hate it. I mean, can you can you hate dentures and then one day love them? Yes, absolutely. Because if you if you stick strictly to the way they taught us in school, everybody's going to eventually hate them. And in and, and, and the way they taught us in school, it robs you of time, it robs you of money, it robs you of everything that's fun. Because, you know, I mean... I won't say all of my friends are compassionate or passionate about dentistry, but I still am. I like it. It's a good living. I'm not outside sweating when it's hot. I'm not, you know, outside freezing to death when it's cold. I'm in a controlled environment. So I like what I do. But, you know, it's like anything. If you don't know how to do it or if the way that it's always been done is horrible, then, no, it's it's you're always going to hate it. But if there's a faster, easier way that takes the stress off of you, it makes life a lot sweeter, a whole lot sweeter. So 
yes, it's possible for anybody to learn to love dentures. You know, even a guy that's been doing it 50 years, 40 years, it, you know, the only problem with a dentist that's been doing it 30 or 40 years, they hate change. They're old dogs that don't like change. I, I don't like change as well as I used to, but I still welcome it because that's the only thing, only way progress happens is if I change. And so for a, a no, new person graduating dental school, learn all you can, take as much CE as you can. And yes, you may or not have a good background in dentures, but you can do dentures. Anybody can. You know, and, the, and another way they'd say that in Kansas is uh, dogs bark at things they don't understand. And right. uh, you, you hate dentures, you hate endo, you hate all this stuff because you don't understand it. You didn't get good at it. The endodontist ain't barking at root canals. The endodontist digs it. The endodontist gets it done. The oral surgeon gets that wisdom tooth out. And, and another last thing is that um, Regina Herzlinger is a Ph.D. medical economist at Harvard University. And she showed everybody some very interesting research back in the day in her book. I think it was her book was Health versus Wealth or I, I forgot the name of it. Anyway, she said that uh, the faster you do something, the higher the quality. And people wanted to think, well, if it's really slow, you must be taking the time to do it right. She said, no, that's absolutely wrong. If you do your hernia surgeries under five minutes, you don't even have a 1% failure rate. By the time your hernia operation takes you, the surgeon 10 minutes, he has a 5%. By the time that hernia operation takes a half an hour, this guy's got a 15% failure rate. Well, look at a, an oral surgeon. He'll pull all four of them wisdom teeth in 10 minutes. And then you got some dentist dinking around an hour with just one impacted tooth. Same thing with the, with the endodontist. I mean, I've seen these endodontist offices. They only schedule an hour for a molar root canal. They get them all done. So so if you That's are, what I do. you know, a lot of dentists say, well, you know, uh, when I tell some dentists that, okay, this guy across the street only, only schedules 30 minutes for a single crown. They're like, oh, well, he's a hack. My God, I schedule an hour and a half and... And he's just, he's just going too fat. No, I guarantee you, you, you have a, this guy numbs. And while it's soaking in, he's taking the shade and the impression of the temporary. And then when the timer goes ding, he's using septicane, sets a timer for four minutes. You don't even set a timer. You just give him septicane and then go back to your office and start playing on, on Facebook. And then as soon as that's four minutes, he packs a zero cord and a one card. So he pushes the tissue down and out. Then he preps it. And then he makes a temporary with his assistant because forehanded making a temporary, you make that temporary in three or four minutes. And in that temporary, you find out when you're trimming the temporary that, well, where'd the margin go? You don't have a margin. You learn a lot about your prep when you're making a temporary. And then you're adjusting the occlusion and you just threw the temporary. Well, that's why you're getting reduction coping because you made the temporary after you took the impression. So that, that guy's got the, the temporary completely made. He's got the margin. Every, he's got his clearance. He takes the impression while that sets up. He goes, does a hygiene check, comes back. The impression's good. Cement's temporary, gone in 30 minutes. And the guy dinking around for an hour and a half is the guy who gets a reduction coping back or a remake. Well, I delegated my cord packing to my assistant because I like to delegate because then I'm more efficient. Dude, you left the room for 15 minutes for the cord packing delegation when you could have stayed in the room and done it yourself in two minutes. And, 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 and they leave and they leave the assistant in the room alone to make the temporary and they give her a half an hour to do that when they could have made the temporary in four minutes. Yeah, I, my temporaries are three to five minutes every time. Very seldom will I take any longer than that. I, I was going to tell you, I got a buddy who's a Cajun, okay? And I went to school at LSU, so he called me one day. I'm in school and I've practiced this way the rest of my entire career. He said... He called me Baca. He said, Baca, don't be spending all day on that tooth. He said, I can wash my truck 45 minutes. It's a big old truck. He said, 45 minutes, I'm all the way around my truck. Got the inside clean, the outside clean. He said, that tooth is about five millimeters across and about 10 millimeters tall. Don't be all day. He said, cut that tooth. And you know, I practice that way. I don't, we don't see any extra endo because of it. Our patients are happy, and they didn't have to sit in a chair. And that's the way I practiced my whole career. Yeah. Truck, you know? I got I got four fingers. They stand for faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost. And if you're not doing everything faster, easier, higher in quality, lower in cost, you're wasting my time. And so many people, 
They're always asking me to sign an NDA. I get a request to sign an NDA every damn two weeks, and it's a non-disclosure agreement. And I, I won't sign one because, number one, I'm in dentistry. And you want me to yeah. sign some deal about dentistry? I'm saying, first of all, two things. Number one, every single person I've signed an NDA for has never brought the, par- the product to market. Every single mm-hmm. one. Because you shouldn't be worried about someone going to steal your idea. You should get your idea to market. And your protective, your protective mode around your business is you got it to market. You got it to market faster and easier and higher in quality and lower in cost. And you think your salvation is going to be because I signed a non-disclosure agreement? I mean, imagine explaining that on Shark Tank to Mark Cuban. Well, I can't give you the pitch today on Shark Tank until you sign a non-disclosure agreement. What, what do you think Mr. Wonderful would say to you if you said that on, on Shark Tank? Sign my NDA. And, uh, and again... Um, love you guys in the South. Love, uh, love Chris Griffin. Love um, Corey, Glenn. Love Joseph Barker. You please go to his website, RapidDentures.com, and learn how to make dentures faster, easier, higher in quality, lower in cost. Learn to love dentures again, Joseph. I can't wait till you uh, do an online C course or write us an article because um, I remember when I got out of school in '87, they predicted the dentures would go the way of the dinosaur. And now I'm out of school 30 years later, and they make more units of denture today than they did in 1987. A lot of it's because we get 1 million legal immigrants a day, I mean a year, and 2 million illegal. A lot of the dentures I'm making, there are people that immigrated from Romania, Mexico, Central South America. So dentures ain't going away. They told me it was going away 30 years ago, and it's bigger today. You know, there's a lab... I'm in Phoenix. If I drive to the Mexican border, Nogales, there's a lab down there where all the impressions are sent to Nogales, Arizona, United States. Then they put them in a van, drive them across, and they have the partial framework in Nogales, uh, Mexico. They make 1,200 partial frameworks a day. A lot of these labs that do dentures and partials don't actually cast the framework, and all their customers uh, are dental labs. But, man, they're doing 1,200 partial frameworks a day. So trust me, removable is going to be here for the next century. I, I don't, I don't worry about anybody coming in and hurting me. I don't because it's not that I think I've got it figured out. It's just so much out there. There's a ton of removable to do for everyone, and then if you can do the upsell and get the implants, that's even better. Yep. And my sister lives in. Uh, she lives in Fort Smith. Arkansas. How close are you from Fort Smith? It's about three hours from where I'm at right now. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, there's two states that are the most beautiful that no one talks about, and it's um, Arkansas and North Carolina. You got four seasons. It's gorgeous. The seasons are mild. Like, like um, you know, you still get the spring and the fall, but you don't have the, the you know, I grew up in Kansas, you know, those and Nebraska, I mean, those winds. And, I mean, Arkansas, and, and it's is it the White River? Yes, sir. I, that's why I moved home for the White River. Yeah. So when my dad and I went to see uh, Bentonville, we um, um, birthplace of Sam Walt, we went uh, trout fishing in the White River, and I, I went trout fishing there two or three times with Dad, and uh, that was the most amazing trout fishing. The beauty. Now, is there a place where the White River meets the Brown River? Is there a Brown River too? No, it's a Black River. Black. Yes. So it's the where the white meets the black. That's where I live. Is right That's over. where Dad and I went trout fishing with uh, Dan and Beverly Carney, the founder of Pizza Hut, um, a bunch of Sonic guys. No, that's North Fork River. That's on up. I live where white and black meet, but white meets the buffalo up there, and it also meets the North Fork River, which is kind of right up in that area where and around Rogers, Bentonville, around Mountain Home. Huh. God dang, that was fun. Just caught trout all day long. I think all we were using was a little gold hook and a kernel of corn. Yeah. we. Uh, that's what I use to this day. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right, buddy. I hope you uh, thank you for uh, spending your Friday afternoon coming on the show, talking to my homies. I hope you just have a rocking hot weekend. How old's your little boy now? He's 10. Just remember this. Don't ever forget this. Right now, you're like sitting on the beach and you're enjoying the ocean. You have no idea 
there's a hurricane 100 miles out to sea, packed in 400 mile an hour winds. When my boys, before the oldest one got his car keys, I thought, you know, my boys are so perfect. I should write a damn book. How to raise four perfect boys. They were perfect. And then one by one got their car keys and got in more trouble in an hour and a half than they did their previous 16 years. So you got about six more years of just smooth sailing and you think you're the best parent in the world. Then you give him a pair of car keys and he'll drive on the other side of town. And, and it usually, it usually all the trouble has something to do with either a six pack of beer, a girl or the craziest friend from their school. But between those three things, enjoy the next six years. <laughs> that's, that's actually what I told my wife. I said, I figure we got him till he's 15 or 16 tops. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. There's nothing more dangerous on earth than giving a boy a set of car keys. <laughs> that is, that is the worst idea anyone ever came up with. I should dig up Henry Ford and shoot him twice and bury him again <laughs> for inventing that damn assembly line. All right, buddy. Have a rocking hot day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.